Welcome to Free World Connect. My name is Gunnar Heckmark, I'm chairman of Stockholm Free World Forum. And together with me, I have Katarina Tratz, who is the executive director of Free World Forum. And we have four extremely interesting guests in order to discuss Russia and the West, um, the inward repression and outward aggression. A lot of things are happening in our world. We have seen the Russian build up with the borders of Ukraine, and we have some, seen some developments in Prague. Uh, with us today, we have, um, among others, we have Anders Oslund, who is a senior fellow at Atlantic Council, Carola Vendil Palin, who is a research leader at the Institute of uh, Res Defense Research in Sweden, and Kurt Volker, former representative in Hawaii to Ukraine, and Jakob Kalemski, senior fellow Atlantic Council. And when I mention Anders Olsund being a senior fellow at Atlantic Council, I would like to add that he's also senior fellow at Stockholm Free World Forum. And we are to discuss the inward repression and the outward aggression. And I think we will start in Prague. Please, Jakob Kalensky, would you like to have a go? Thank you very much for having me and, and thank you for uh, the interest in what's happening currently in Prague. Uh, I believe it's making headlines in, in many European countries. But although we see the consequences only now, the events happened already in 2014, and the people who were blowing up the ammunition warehouse here in the Czech Republic, killing two Czech citizens, it is the same GRU unit that tried to orchestrate a coup in Montenegro in 2016, uh, which included an assassination attempt on the prime minister. It's the same people who tried to murder uh, Skripals in 2018. These people also met it in the uh, Catalan independence movement uh, in a destabilization campaign in Moldova. They worked for years practically unopposed, acting like an organized crime unit hired by the Kremlin. Um, if we consider the history of Kremlin's aggression in their neighborhood, which uh, in the history of Putin's regime began probably with the 2007 bronze soldier incident in Estonia and 2008 uh, war in Georgia, um, and escalated with the Anschluss of Crimea and war crimes in Syria, it is actually more surprising that we in Europe haven't acted a bit earlier uh, than, than, than this. If you ask me, I think we are still not uh, robust enough. The fact is that the Kremlin continues with their aggression and they prove uh, beyond doubt that they don't really uh, find our reaction so far to, to be stopping them. So currently the Czech Republic is sending back home over 60 diplomats, uh, which I believe is a good thing since we are only restoring uh, the normal order of things. The disbalance between the numbers of the uh, Czech embassy in Moscow and the Russian embassy here in Prague, this disbalance is still a residuum of the 1968 occupation. Uh, that was the turning point when the Russian embassy in Prague became significantly stronger than the Czech embassy in Moscow. So we are now restoring back the order uh, from, from some 50 years ago. Uh, we didn't fix it in those three decades we spent as a, as a free state. And it took a terrorist attack of the GRU uh, on the Czech soil to finally start solving uh, this problem. Uh, so although the current wave in the Czech Republic is certainly very welcome, I, I don't think we should be thinking that the problem is already solved. We might be on a good track, but I think we still need to be quite alert. Thank you very much. And, and one of your points is that we are starting to understand what is going on and starting to act after that. Would, uh, Carolina, would you like to, to say some words about what is going on in, in Russia and what are the dynamics? Yes, uh, thank you. I, I think these past few days we've all been following uh, very eagerly what's happening along the Ukrainian border. Uh, and to me, um, it's an example of how we often focus on what's happening this very minute. Um, Russia, again, has a guessing what it'll do next, uh, something that Russia loves, I would say. Um, and very often we're told that um, by Western observers that Russia doesn't have a strategy, it only has tactics. But 
I would say that Russia has been very consistent, uh, remarkably consistent when it comes to its strategic goals. Um, and it has been also very outspoken about these goals. And the first goal is to remain a great power, especially in its neighborhood, uh, and to have a recognized uh, sphere of interest. Uh, Ukraine and Belarus are included in that sp sphere of interest. Um, and I know, noticed now that people were heaving a sigh of relief, as uh, Russia said, it was redrawing its troops from the Ukrainian border. But actually, I would argue that Russia has already used its military power because it's demonstrated what it can do at the Ukrainian border. And thus, it changes the political dynamics. It changes how we think about what's possible. Um, so it uses its military power even when it just displays it because it has a military power. The other strategic goal, I would say, is um, to secure its political system, the political system that Putin has established in Russia uh, during these past uh, two decades. So political stability is the other strategic goal. And in Russian thinking, when there are protests in Belarus or when Ukraine moves towards Western values, this undermines also political stability inside Russia. So this is how intimately it's all linked. Um, so these are the long-term goals, but I would also just like to say a couple of words about long-term trends, because relations between the West and Russia, they've gone from bad to worse to really lousy, uh, and they they keep in going in this downward uh, spiral. But another very strong trend is the increasing repression inside Russia, increasing surveillance. Uh, and when Navalny was poisoned this autumn, um, and uh, uh, it, it was actually an attempt on his life, uh, this was just another step along this trend towards more autocracy in Russia. And Andrei Kalesnikov, I think he, he said something very uh, poignant uh, this week. He, he said that there's a no new openness in Russia. And of course, he's not talking about some kind of democratic openness. What he's talking about is the fact that the Russian political leadership no longer tries to hide the fact that it's uh, repressive, that it, it's trying to punish and scare the opposition into silence. It mm -hmm. uses its uh, police uh, without discrimination, I would say. And I mean, certainly one thing we've seen these past uh, few months is that it, it even um, arrests the press nowadays, which, which it it you didn't used to. So it's another step, I would say, along the way. And and the most important word in Russian politics, I would say, has become Russian sovereignty. It's almost like a religion. Everything can be sovereign, and Russia must be sovereign. Um, and of course, because of this, Russia will not give in to pressure from abroad or from inside. I mean, it, it's another way of displaying sovereignty, which is a lead word, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. So the new openness, you can say, they don't even try to look good. They are happy to look bad, just to say, and, uh, and to, to make that as a threat. Kurt, uh, may I ask you to, to give one piece of explanation regarding the build up and what the Russians try to, to achieve by that. Uh, Carolina has touched upon it, but uh, it would be interesting to hear your perspective. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. I, I, I did my math on my uh, cell phone calculator here. Um, 60 Russian diplomats expelled from the Czech Republic is one for every 175,000 Czechs. Uh, the average US congressional district is 700,000 people. So that's an awful lot of Russian intelligence presence per capita in the Czech Republic. So congratulations on removing them. <laughs> the uh, question that you're asking is, uh, I think it's, what is Putin doing and what does it mean now? And, and Karo did touch on that. Uh, first off, he is demonstrating to the Russian people using disinformation that he is in fact uh, the defender of Russia's interest in the world and the great Russian nation. And so 
they should tolerate his authoritarianism and his strongman rule at home because they need him to defend Russia's interest against external threats. The second is he's trying to demonstrate to the near neighbors, uh, Ukraine and Belarus and others, Georgia included, that uh, Russia has the capability and the will to act and the West does not. And so they had better be careful and they are going to need to deal with him and need to deal with Russia. Um, I use those words deliberately, capability and will, because the third aim of Putin here is deterrence. Uh, deterrence is the exercise of cap demonstration of capability and the willingness to act in order to prevent uh, another party from doing something uh, because they would know that the costs are unacceptable. And I believe that Putin is exercising deterrence against the West, uh, that uh, he is causing us to rethink how close should NATO be to Ukraine? How close should the European Union be to Ukraine? Uh, the United States was going to put two destroyers into the Black Sea and turn them around because we didn't want to escalate the situation. Uh, a result of all that is that I think Putin is trying to deter the West from thinking of Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia as truly independent states that truly should be able to form their own destiny and their own security arrangements. So he's trying to expose the hollowness of the rhetoric coming out of Washington and Brussels as compared with the willingness to act coming from Washington and Brussels. And if I could make one recommendation to my friends in, in Brussels and to my friends in Washington, uh, it is we need to be taking some concrete actions, put some things on the table to demonstrate to Putin that we are not deterred. I ask you, because I know that you will have to leave very soon, I ask you, did Putin achieve what he wanted to achieve? Yes. Or rather, does he believe he wanted to achieve what he wanted to? Yes, I think so. Um, I think those who are now saying that the decision to pull the, the forces back to permanent bases are uh, misreading what's happening here. First off, we don't know what permanent bases means. Uh, maybe Crimea is now the permanent base for some of these forces. Maybe the equipment stays there and some of the troops may uh, go back to where they came from, but they leave the equipment pre-positioned. Uh, secondly, uh, he has demonstrated the ability to move forces in at a very significant scale, very rapidly. And I think he believes that he has demonstrated that the West did nothing. And so when it comes to dealing with Zelensky or dealing with uh, Georgia or even Belarus, he's demonstrated that he's the only one with the capability and the will to act. Uh, an example, two examples of this this week that are worth commenting on. One of them was the speech he gave in the Duma in which he explicitly stated his intention here, which is to say that any movement against Russia's interests will be met asymmetrically, swiftly, and harshly. Uh, and that uh, if anyone goes against Russian interests, they will regret it in, the way, in a way they've never regretted anything before. Uh, so this is a clear threat to the West to not touch uh, Russia's neighborhood. And when Russia does something in that neighborhood that we need to stand by and let it happen, mm -hmm. Uh, that's the intent of that. Uh, the other thing is Zelensky suggested that he would go to Moscow and meet with Putin to have a discussion about peace in the Donbas. And Putin said that he'd be very happy to see Zelensky, but not to talk about the Donbas because that is an internal Ukrainian issue. Uh, completely false narrative coming straight from Putin. And uh, that is a way of trying to embarrass and denigrate Zelensky and to show that he's on his own here, that uh, the West is not going to help him. Thank you, Kurt. So Anders, if Putin can say, check, check, now he achieved two things. What would you say is his greater game? What is his game here? What do we want to do next up? Well, well I would rather turn it the other way around. I think that he has overplayed his hand uh, very badly. Uh, I think that uh, he had uh, many different aims in line with what uh, uh, Ankara uh, uh, said. Uh, first, he wanted a meeting with Biden and he wanted to uh, destabilize the new Biden administration, where very few people have been, uh, be, been appointed. He doesn't like the direction that Zelensky has uh, taken since uh, February. So he wanted to destabilize Zelensky. He didn't get anything uh, done there. On the contrary, that Zelensky is now coming out firmly against um, 
Putin as he has not done before. He wanted to uh, get some uh, appeasement and th th that is out. He wanted something in order to cheer Russia up before the Duma election, some patriotic mobilization. I don't think that he has uh, uh, go uh, got uh, that. Um, and he's completely lost in domestic po uh, politics. Uh, the speech that he gave to the Federal uh, Assembly uh, the day before yesterday was really awful. 20 minutes coronavirus, uh, 20 minutes uh, uh, social policy nonsense, uh, odd numbers uh, worthy of uh, Leonid Brezhnev without any clear uh, meaning and uh, uh, 20 minutes uh, nonsense about the, uh, the, the economy and essentially saying we want to restore the standard of living. Well, uh, Russia's GDP has stagnated for the seven last years. Uh, Western uh, sanctions are far more effective and understood. At the same time, uh, Central Europe has been growing by four, four and a half uh, percent a year during this uh, period. And uh, the real disposable incomes have fallen by 11% in the last um, uh, seven years. I mean, this is really disastrous economic management and disastrous social uh, management. Uh, Russians are really upset about how the coronavirus situation has been uh, managed. Uh, Russian life expectancy last year fell by 2.2 years in one year. That is really quite uh, quite uh, extraordinary. And then back to what uh, uh, Jacob uh, said, uh, uh, he talked about the GRU squad that has been moving around killing people. There is also an FSB squad that has been moving around uh, killing uh, people that we will probably now see more investigated. My suspicion is that it's the US intelligence that is providing this information and did not do so uh, under Trump for uh, uh, obvious reasons. At the same time, we are seeing that the SVR, the Foreign Intelligence Service, and the GRU uh, have cyber squads that are causing a lot of damage. Russia behaves like a road state and as a terrorist state. And I think that uh, this will be called out. The next step uh, in sanctions is really to declare it uh, rogue terrorist states. The US declares four states uh, uh, rogue terrorist states. And if you compare with Iran, Russia today looks uh, uh, much worse. It's only because Iran doesn't have nuclear arms uh, uh, as yet that it can be uh, dealt with. So I would expect much more to come. And I think that what the Biden administration did now uh, last week, it was that it set up a framework for uh, uh, sanctioning Russia much more. The, long, the first sanction of the primary um, uh, government bonds issued in rubles was little, but the secondary uh, trade is likely to come in the summer uh, when uh, the next step, according to this, uh, Chemical and Biological Weapon Act needs to be uh, bit, uh, taken. And I think that Nord Stream 2 will be blocked because oh. both parties in the Congress are dead against it. Uh, the Biden administration wants to uh, give the Germans an opportunity to say something first. There's nothing the Germans sure. can say that makes right. sense. So therefore right. it will uh, stop. And then sanctions against oligarchs and uh, more financial sanctions. So I think that Putin is really a dead ender. He has overplayed a very weak hand. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Katarina, what do we make uh, out of this? Um, can we create an order about these different views? Um, I don't think they are contradictory. No, I think that they provide uh, various perspectives that, that sort of complement each other. But uh, I know that our panelist Kurt Volker needs to leave soon. So I have I have a few questions for all of you in the panel. But I would start with my question to you, Kurt. You mentioned just briefly that you think it's time for the West and um, more specifically uh, your friends in Brussels, that is the, the European Union and so forth. To, to provide some concrete actions. Could you sort of give us a wish list of what you would like to see, but and also an analysis of what you think will happen? So I'll start with that. I think the most important thing that Brussels could do is to identify in advance the sanctions it will put in place if Russia takes military action or uh, legal action uh, with respect to Ukraine or Belarus or, or Georgia. When I say legal action, I mean recognizing the independence of the Luhansk or Donetsk People's Republics, 
or taking the union with Belarus further, unifying the armed forces of the two states, anything like that should have a response and the EU would, should be able to articulate in advance some very tough measures that they would put in place if Russia were to do that. Uh, so I think that's the most important thing there. Uh, the second thing is uh, visibility. Uh, I don't think the EU has been terribly visible in this crisis uh, or this military standoff that we've seen so far. Uh, people going to Ukraine, meeting with Zelensky, uh, making more public statements. I think there could be much more visibility. Uh, I do want to give Chancellor Merkel credit for uh, specifically calling on Putin to withdraw the forces. She normally doesn't go that far. She tries to play this game of both sides need to de-escalate uh, when it's really only Russia doing the escalation. But in this case, she actually did call out Russia specifically. I think that was a good step. On the Washington side, the same thing, uh, pre-identify sanctions that could be put in place. Uh, don't pull back destroyers or naval forces from the Black Sea, put more in. Uh, ad advance the delivery of security assistance to Ukraine in a demonstrative way so that people see we are continuing to do that. Mm -hmm. Name a U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and identify an official who will take on the role of uh, the diplomatic work around trying to support Ukraine and, and bring uh, peace in the Donbass. Could be a sitting official or it could be a special representative, it doesn't matter, but somebody needs to be designated to take on those roles. Thank you, Kurt. Sure. And uh, just a follow-up question to, to all of the panel, and you can answer also first, Kurt, before you leave. Uh, while we're speaking here, Alexei Navalny is struggling for his life in, uh, in, in prison or in custody. Um, I wonder if you could provide some reflection on whether there's a connection of the increasing inwards repression in Russia paired with the, the escalated outwards aggression that we're seeing and whether Naval, the Navalny case is sort of um, trying to send a message also to us in the West. Well, I think what we're seeing, Putin's determination to arrest Navalny, to deprive him of medical care, the earlier effort to try to poison him, the arrest of the protesters that are protesting around the country uh, because of the treatment of Navalny. Uh, these are things that um, demonstrate that they bother Putin. That if, if these are happening, he's concerned enough to actually throw Navalny in jail and to actually arrest these protesters. Normally he would not do that. So I think it is a reflection of a deteriorating situation for Putin, as Anders said, uh, within Russia. And I do think that, uh, to, again, steal Anders's word, a patriotic mobilization is very much what Putin would like to achieve. He may not have achieved it this time, but I think if he can create some kind of a demonstration of Western impotence and the Ukrainian provocation to which Russia responds, I think he still has this in the back of his mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kurt, and thank you for joining us here today. And I would like to direct the, the same questions to the rest of the panel, uh, namely on specifically what the Western response to these events that we have seen lately should be, and also your reflections on, on the increasing repression in Russia uh, and its relation to, to its foreign policy. Perhaps you could start, Jacob. Thank you. Uh... Uh, I, I used to work in Brussels for three years, so whereas I agree with most of what Kurt uh, offered, I, I wouldn't really hold my breath that this will happen anytime <laughs> soon. But, I mean, someone has to take the lead, someone has to start, and I think, you know, uh, it, it, if, I, if I should bet on someone, it, it will be someone from the Nordic Baltic region who will be the first ones on the barricade. Um, but um, I, think, I think there's still a lot that we could try and do, a lot that we haven't tried yet. Despite what Anders said, I, I, I agree that the sanctions work much better than most people in the West mm. uh, or even in Russia think, but I still think that there is a lot more we could be doing in this regard. I believe you can still buy a, a Mercedes or a BMW in Moscow. I don't think that should be allowed. <laughs> I think we should be, the, the sanctions could be tougher. Uh, I think we should be sanctioning uh, some particular individuals and companies. Um, my main expertise uh, in, when it comes to Russia is disinformation campaigns. As I frequently say, uh, the biggest advertisers on Russian state TV are Western companies. Uh, Nestle, Mars, uh, Oriflame. Um, I mean, it's Western companies paying for anti-Western propaganda. There is, there is a huge space uh, that, uh, in the sanctions where, where we could really up, up the game. 
But apart from that, and again, I will just uh, reverberate what, what Anders said, just declaring Russia a terrorist state or a rogue state, that would change a lot. We, we can't be just treating people representing Putin's regime the same as we treat diplomats from civilized countries. Mm. <laughs> that, that's just a mistake. We provide them with the legitimacy that they don't deserve. Um, this would be maybe a more symbolic gesture, but the symbolic gestures still have quite a lot of power. Uh, and uh, it would have it would have effects on, on the media coverage. It would have effects on, on the hearts and minds of the citizens. So um, I think uh, sanctioning both individuals and organizations that are involved in the, in the aggression, be it uh, the murders and poisonings or the information aggression and uh, kind of denying access and denying legitimacy. Uh, these are two tools that could be applied just tomorrow, uh, not to think about uh, of, of some more uh, audacious measures. All right, thank you. Uh, Carolina, you, you were, uh, perhaps you can focus more on the issue of Navalny and the, how, how that it might be used and how that might sort of correspond to the, the foreign policy measures that we're seeing. Yes, um, I mean, I'll, I'll just say um, a couple of words also on, on sanctions or measures that we can take in the West. And, and I think one of the points that is often missed when it comes to the sanctions is the fact that they send a signal to Russia, of course, but they also send signals among ourselves. They're important because they're a display of unity. Um, and symbols matter. I, I absolutely agree with Jakob that they hear. Um, I think often we, we think about um, sanctions or for that matter, when we stretch out a hand to Russia, we think that we can somehow um, determine what the response will be in Russia. And usually that's a dead end. I mean, we usually get the reverse response from what we expected. So I, I think we should think more about um, uniting among ourselves and, uh, and around our values and principles. I think that is the way forward and not think about a specific response that we want to elicit from Russia because we, we're never going to do that. Um, and then before, when it comes... Okay, Karina, before we move on, there, isn't yeah. it so that we in some way shy away from recognizing what Russia is today? I mean, we are yeah. so used to, 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 to treat Russia and a lot of other countries, us other countries with the same logic. And we are in some way, we are not really prepared. Jakob started saying something about that, that we are in, in some way understanding, starting to understand what is going on. But could you say that we still haven't understood what is going on? Well, I think often we, uh... We tend to bo both demonize and idealize Russia at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a country that, you know, elicit very uh, strong feelings for some reason. And we have a problem of just um, being more cool about our decision making. Um, and, and when Russia says, you know, we shouldn't focus on values, we should focus on interests. Well, for the EU, values is a hardcore interest. And, and we should be very clear about that when we talk to Russia. And, and just as an aside, I mean, Russian diplomats, they are extremely skillful. Um, and, and seeing sometimes how negotiations go, uh, I mean, they, they, they have um, incredible experience and often run circles around us. Um, but if I move on to Navalny, uh, I would just like to stress that Russia, it's an author authoritarian system and they try to control elections, but at the same time, all author authoritarian systems are at their most nervous when, when they're holding elections. And Russia is going to hold Duma elections this September. And last time you had big protests in, in, uh, in Moscow was in 2011 after a Duma election and, um, and all the allegations of uh, election fraud that followed. So I would say the political leadership is worried. Um, they're also um, worried about Navalny because he represents, he's a symbol of 
what should not exist in Putin's political system. He is a viable political alternative. And that's why they didn't even want to mention him by name. They talked about him as the patient from Berlin and so on. Well, then uh, the second thing about Navalny that bothers the political leadership, I would say, is the fact that he's fearless. The way he came back, even after uh, an attempt on his life, that demonstrated that he's not afraid. And that's one of his key political messages. Don't be afraid. It's a very strong one. And then just, just to end, I think one of the long-term trends that we can't really put our fingers on right now is the fact that Russian society is changing. And certainly when you look at what the younger um, generation, what they think about politics, what they think about increased surveillance in, in Russia. There's uh, an opinion gap and it's a widening opinion gap between a younger, younger generation and an older generation in Russia. And the Russian political leadership is well aware of this. And, and it's something that they're worried about. Anders? Okay, so sorry, sorry. No, oh, Anders, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, let me give you three points that uh, have not been made now. Uh, I lived in Moscow uh, in, in the mid uh, 1980s, and I remember very well on the 8th of December 1986, Anatoly Marchenko, the most prominent uh, political prisoner, died after three months of hunger strike and there was an enormous outcry. So 11 days later, uh, Gorbachev uh, uh, freed uh, Andrei Sakharov, the most pro prominent dissident uh, from Gorky, and uh, two months later, all the prominent political refugees were, uh, prisoners were, uh, were freed from the labor camps. So this completely changed Russia. And therefore, I think that Navalny is for Putin a low, slow situation. If he kills uh, Navalny, which he would really like to do, then uh, it will be a Marchenko effect. If uh, uh, Navalny uh, stays alive, then he will become a Sakharov. So whatever Putin does, uh, he has put himself in a complete trap where he's not likely to come out. And as uh, Caro said, with regard to the Duma elections and with regard to the change in mentality in Russia, which very much comes from uh, the complete dead end policies that Putin has pursued since 2012, he has done nothing to improve uh, the life for, for the population. My second point is that in order to make uh, the sanctions more effective, the West needs more transparency, and the transparency is coming now. The European Union has now by and large established a public registries of all ultimate uh, beneficiary uh, owners, and uh, this will sort out what uh, sanction uh, all uh, Russian oligarchs own what. And the UK is also doing this and the United States adopted now at the end of December, the Corporate Transparency Act, which will do the same in the US within three years. So then we will know all this uh, $1 trillion of Russian money in the West where that money actually is and what, what is sanctioned and uh, should, uh, should be frozen. So I think that this will completely undermine uh, Putin's uh, positions. And then uh, thirdly, the bad point, Belarus. Uh, you probably read uh, Putin's uh, conversation with Lukashenko yesterday. It was all about the union state, what concerned the, uh, uh, bilateral relations. Uh, Lukashenko went much further saying how they were uh, completing the union state than, than he has done before. There were always some caveats with Lukashenko, but there was very little of it uh, this time. And then both of them piled on the poor Z Zelensky and uh, uh, said how he, of course, must uh, talk to the people in Donbass. So the positive thing here is that there's no way Zelensky can do anything with Lukashenko and uh, Putin after uh, this, but uh, it looks very worrisome about Belarus, and that's what we really should focus on now. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and it's something that Anders touched upon. It's uh, stopping the influx of the dirty money, uh, which is um, something how uh, those people who are stealing the money from, from the regular Russians, they want to spend it in the West. They don't want to spend it in Russia. So uh, punishing them would also be another way how to try and alter uh, their behavior. Absolutely. Isn't there a trend going on among authoritarian regimes or dictatorial regimes so they are getting even more authoritarian and dictatorial? I mean, we see how Russia has become more repressive and, and more aggressive. And, and in China, you see the same pattern. Uh, is this because they are, those who are having the power are getting more fearful for people's uh, concerns or are, is it because we are looking weaker in the eyes? in their eyes um, under ourselves. Well, Freedom House has uh, reported this since 2005 that authoritarianism is uh, increasing and democracy is declining. And one of the major points is that the authoritarians have become much more clever. Uh, we have in recent years and a lot of massive popular uh, protests, for example, in Hong Kong with two million people and it didn't change any regime. Uh, so there have been lots of big mass protests, uh, but uh, the, the result in regime change has been much less uh, than before. Uh, colored revolutions are not uh, as uh, effective as they were uh, 15 years ago. But, but is this because they are becoming more clever or are they more afraid than they were before? I would say that they are becoming more uh, clever and also in particular the Chinese and the Russians are very good at using cyber techniques. And uh, so if you look up on Russia, Russia has about 250 political prisoners that are recognized by the human rights uh, organization. You should say that it's uh, the real number is much bigger if you take uh, businessmen uh, who are really there because they have done something uh, political. But it's in any case a small uh, number while uh, Putin uses extraordinary uh, su surveillance te uh, techniques and now the, uh, the Chinese have uh, 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 made these uh, uh, identification techniques, um, uh, facial identification techniques very effective so that they can even see if uh, somebody is a Uyghur uh, by uh, the, uh, the ethnic uh, features. So uh, 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 we are right now in an or George Orwell world where the, the technology is against the democracy, while you also have technology that is in favor of democracy, the telegram channels um, that, that are used everywhere, uh, uh, pushed by um, the, the Russian the Pavel Durov who has fled to Dubai. And uh, th this is a system that works against the dictatorships, but uh, we have a both and we don't know where technology will come out in, in the end. Right now, it's uh, benefiting the uh, totalitarians in uh, Russia and China, I'm afraid. So Katarina, what shall we do? But when we did, presented the book, The Grey Zone in Swedish uh, a week ago in Sweden, uh, I think one of the things we discussed uh, in the part we broadcasted later was that there is uh, a lot of people uh, responsible for services and authorities regarding security saying that uh, in reality, saying, don't you see what is going on? Because they are reporting about things going on, but it is in some way not coming through. I mean, Katharina, would you like to... to, to to, to, to land this and uh, ask our, our guests, why, why don't we understand what is going on? Yes, and I will also provide my rather depressive answer to your question, Gunnar. Are the authoritarians upping their game because they're more scared or because we're weaker? Uh, unfortunately, I think it's, it's the latter. I think that the West has been too comfortable and too lazy and, and too, a bit too hopeful without being careful at the same time uh, in the belief that uh, that we all want the same thing in the end and that sort of liber liberal democracy is sort of the the end game and the the goal for everyone that that has proven not to be the case um, 
whereas authoritarians that states have taken advantage of the fact that that we in the west have believed this so firmly without sort of taking precautionary measures uh, of how this drive can be used in various ways that was sort of an an to, to an answer to your question Gunnar and I would also like to ask our panel just briefly to give us some um, some final remarks thoughts on the way forward here um, what the prospects are and what you think sort of will happen and what you wish would happen and I will start with uh, Carolina Well first of all Katarina I, I agree with you I think we we've been a bit um, comfortable. I mean, we, we've been lazy, but we've also been, I think, a bit greedy. We, um, we forgot that it actually costs resources to build your security, to, uh, uh, to build strong institutions and, and protect our institutions. So I think perhaps we were a bit greedy and lazy. But I would be more positive. I mean, I see a lot of signs that we're, we're uh, starting to rebuild our institutions and, and uh, take more care about our security. So I, I think um, in the long term, um, our systems, our political systems and our economic systems tend to um, produce better results. And, and the fact that we have immigration flows to Europe, I mean, that I, to me, that that's also a sign that we have soft power and something to offer that people would like to be part of. So I'm, I would just like to see us more confident uh, in um, the benefits and the very real um, good that our systems provide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, um, what do you think? Yeah, I think that we are in quite a dangerous uh, situation. And the reason is that Russia is now a declining power. Declining powers are dangerous because Russia will never be as strong militarily as it is now. What you do in such a situation is you use your military power. Uh, for Swedes, I think of uh, uh, Karl X, uh, Gustav in 1655 attacking Poland for no good, uh, good reason whatsoever, uh, because he had a wonderful uh, military force after the Thirty Year War. Why not use it? He was a soldier himself. He, uh, that was uh, uh, what he knew. And think of it that uh, it was Austria-Hungary that started World War I by declaring war on Serbia. So I think that we should be very worried about what uh, Putin does in his immediate uh, neighborhood. And uh, Belarus is my main concern. I think uh, Ukraine is basically strong enough uh, to stand up uh, for itself uh, 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 militarily. So this is what I'm really worrying about. Thank you. And then some final remarks to, to Jacob. Um, I would like to hope that we are not going to miss this opportunity as we missed so many wake-up calls before. I mean, it, it's not like this is the first time that uh, we see that the Kremlin is a threat. We've seen it many, many times. And unfortunately, after the first wave, when we have strong statements and, and a few diplomats' expulsions, in a few months, uh, we tend to forget it again. And we see very often uh, many leaders in the West, again, calling for dialogue with this terrorist state, uh, which is proven that it simply doesn't lead anywhere, uh, but you will always find someone who, who goes and tries it. Mm, so I, I would hope that uh, the current wave uh, of Kremlin's aggression be not only the things we see happening here in the Czech Republic, but also the buildup in, in, in uh, near Ukraine and uh, whatever might happen to uh, Alexei Navalny. I hope it won't be the worst. I hope this will be finally the, <laughs> the wake up call that will finally make us act a bit more robustly. But um, yeah, the, 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 the recent history teaches us that we tend to forget very quickly, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That's true, we always want to sleep. Uh, but uh, what we see now is that we are more vulnerable than we tend to think, but also that Russia is more of an aggressive threat than we would like to understand it as. And so it's a matter of waking up, but also understanding. And, uh, oh, Katharina, 
Shall we thank our guests? Let's thank our guests um, for their thoughts and, um, and comments here today uh, with us at the Stockholm Free World Forum. Um, we will continue to monitor the situation and to shed light on it in various ways, such as this one for this Free World Connect seminar. Uh, and with that, I wish you all a pleasant rest of the Friday afternoon, and uh, I will see you all soon again. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. Thanks Thank for you. having Thank me. You. Thank you. Discussion. Bye.